So um, if you've heard me speak at all, I've been getting quite a hard time about uh, being a little long-winded. So um, my wife, she said, you know, when you finish your coffee, you're done. (laughs) Wait, this is not mine. I'm ready to go. (laughs) I'm going to keep this. (laughs) All right, I'm ready to go now. Got my coffee. I told uh, Brother Keith earlier this morning, I said, well, he said, are you ready? I said, well, I know what I'm going to say. Now we'll find out what God's going to say. It is an awesome responsibility to, to get to just share the, the, the pulpit with Pastor Scott and so many others. Um, so I always have a little bit of butterflies when I get up here because it's, uh, it's exciting. And uh, like Pastor Scott said, it's kind of bittersweet, but um, I couldn't think of a better way to, uh, to kind of go out than to just share uh, kind of a little bit of what I've learned in the last 17 years. So I know that scares some of you, that you really were serious about the coffee, right? But uh, I'm going to try to wrap it up in about 35 minutes, hopefully. My time hasn't started yet, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the title of my, of my message today is The Power of Choice. And probably the most basic God-given ability that we have is the power of choice, the power to choose. You know, um, nothing, nothing touches my heart more than one of my kids comes up. I didn't give them anything. I didn't do anything. And they just give me a hug or say, Dad, I love you. You know, you expect those things on Father's Day and birthdays and things. But just it's those moments when you weren't expecting anything. You know, it's that it's that power of choice. That's what makes it special. So that, that's kind of my, uh, my focus this morning. And, uh, you know, the Bible has a few things to say about, uh, about choice. Uh, Deuteronomy 3019. I think uh, Kayla always uh, uses this scripture when we get ready to do uh, tithes and offering. She mentioned it this morning. It says to choose life. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, in case that wasn't good enough for you, if you didn't already know the answer, the teacher, Jesus, helps you out. He says, choose life. Okay? He's, he's giving you a little hint there. Choose life and don't choose death so that you and your children may live. Joshua 24 15 says, you know, you have a choice. Uh, Joshua says to the people, he says, you know what? You can decide who you want to follow. Are you going to follow these gods over here? Are you going to follow these gods over here? Do whatever you want. You get to choose. But as for me and my house, at the end of that verse, we will serve the Lord. All right? Proverbs, uh, Psalms, sorry, Psalms 25 and 12. And this tells us that God will even give us a few hints. He's, he's going to tell you the answers. He's a great teacher. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways that they should choose. Okay, a couple more here. Um, Proverbs 1 and 29. You know, a good parent, a good teacher always lets us know that there's consequences for making bad choices. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Can I have the next verse there? Is it handy? Nope. All right. Well, all right. So there's consequences for not choosing, for not choosing, uh, choosing God. Proverbs 3.31 says not to envy the violent or to choose their ways. 
Proverbs 8.10 says, choose my instruction, not silver. Choose my knowledge, not gold. You know, God's ways are different than the ways of the world. All right? And so I want to kind of wrap up my introduction here with just saying that you are where you are today because of the choices you've made. All right? You are exactly where you are today because of the choices you've made. Now, that might be a good thing. You may be able to say, you know what? I've made a lot of really good choices. I've made some good financial choices, and I've done well. I've made some good family choices. I found me a good young lady when I was 20 years old, and she stuck with me for over 25 years. That was a good choice. And I'm where I am today largely because of that choice. I have a wonderful, beautiful wife and a wonderful family. That was a good choice for me. And I'm where I am today because of that. But I can also say there's some things I've done that uh, I'm not real proud of. Some choices that were not very good choices. And so, um, let me tell you a little story before I go any further, just to kind of get into things now. And you, you, if at the end of the story, you can tell me if you know who it is. Starting from nothing, by the time he was 26, he had a net worth of a little over a million dollars. He was making $250,000 a year. That's more than $20,000 a month in net taxable income. He was really having a lot of fun. And, uh, but 98% of the truth is still a lie. And the truth was that 2% got him in a lot of trouble. You see, uh, he had $4 million in real estate. He had a lot of debt, a lot of short-term debt. And because of that, uh, he experienced a really big fall. The short version of the story is that debt caused him and his wife, over the course of two and a half years of fighting it, to lose everything. And after losing everything, he then went on a quest to find out how money works, to find out, um, you know, how to take control of it and how to have confidence in handling it. He read everything he could get his hands on, and even interviewed older, rich people, people who had made a lot of money and kept it. And then he says this about himself. He says, that quest led me to a reality, to a really, really uncomfortable place, my mirror. I came to realize that my money problems, worries, shortages largely began and ended with the person in the mirror. And I also realized that if I could learn to manage the character that I shaved with every morning, that I could win with money. Now, who was it? Dave Ramsey. I love that story. He tells it every time before he ever does a teaching. And that's just a little demonstration of, you know, the power of choice. Bad choices can end you in some, have some catastrophic results. Um, So... I got good news. I I know the secret to success. Always make all the right choices. If you just do that, you got it made. All right? So, um, one thing that I learned was from a gentleman by the name of Dr. John King. He's uh, from Australia. He sounds very Australian, super cool guy to listen to speak. I really enjoyed him. And, um, And he talked about something that he called the transitional decision zone. All right, now if you've been here for 17 years, you might remember this, Um, but it basically comes down to this, that over and over again in life, you are going to come to decisions in life. Now, I'm not talking about what to have for breakfast. I'm not talking about, you know, all decisions. Not all decisions are transitional. Some are just decisions, you know, based on preferences. But I'm talking like those, those that can be life-changing decisions, all right? So I've elected to try to draw a little bit this morning. That is hopefully not going to be a mistake. But if you're going along and 
This is just kind of the course of your life. You're going to come to a decision to make, and that's going to have a span of time in there. So, and then afterwards, you know, life goes on, but somewhere in here, and it's a, tra- it's a zone because, you know, let's face it, our best decisions we stop and think about. Big decisions, we don't just jump right in and make a, a snap decision. We learn that pretty quick. We do that, we make mistakes. But somewhere in here, and I like to just draw it in the middle because I like a nice OCD look there. Brock, is that okay? Did I get that in the right place? Thank you. He's my OCD buddy. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that, you're going to make a decision. And whether that's a good decision or a bad decision kind of determines what happens afterwards. So, um, good decision, you tend to move forward. Bad decision, you're liable to either stay where you're at or you might even move backwards in life. And um, so, what we find is that when we come to one of these decisions, um, you know, Pastor Scott says test. I, I, many times he's kind of referred to this. He calls it a test. And what happens in life when, or in the classroom when you take a test and you don't do well, sometimes you got to do what? Retake the test. Right. Do it again. All right. Well, that happens in the spiritual world too. You will come to a spiritual decision and as you do, this is where I have to, hopefully this goes well. Oh, that's not too bad. It's not great. All right, so here's a transitional decision zone, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one, and you made a decision somewhere in the middle of those. So what happened? As you made a decision, you chose God's way rather than maybe the ways of the world or your own desires, and you spiraled up, and you ended up at a higher level because of that choice. Or you can, you know, you maybe, hopefully, you you go through that, and the cycle just repeats itself. You make a decision, you move on, you deal with the consequences of that decision, good or bad, and then you're going to get another chance to make another decision of some sort. And so, when we continuously choose God, we find this upward upward spiral that takes us to new levels in life and with God. Okay? Now, let's start up here. Well, now what's happening? If this is my starting point and I come to a transitional decision and I'm selfish or thinking worldly in my natural mind and not thinking in godly terms, okay, well, I made a bad decision. So oftentimes what happens is, and oftentimes when this is the case, you come back to that same decision again because God's patient. You know, he doesn't just give up. We rule people out. We're like, they're just never going to get it. I'll be honest, as a band director, there are just some kids I'm like, (laughs) this kid just doesn't got it. But God doesn't do that with us. He's not human like us. He doesn't have those shortcomings. He never gives up. And so you may come back to the exact same decision. You may get another shot at it. But if you keep choosing ways besides God's, what do we call that? We say that person is in a downward spiral, right? Okay. So that's, that, was a big, that was a big thing in my life. I remember that still. That's probably been 15, maybe 20 years ago that I first heard that sermon. And um, you can blame somebody else. You can blame your parents. You can blame your friends. You can blame whoever. You can blame the country. You can blame whoever you want to blame. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, you made the decision. And you're where you are today because of that decision. All right. So, for myself, I just wanted to give kind of a, maybe a personal time in my life when I had to make one of those decisions. I remember when I went off to college, and it was my first night in college, 
first night away from home, and uh, an upperclassman comes by my room, uh, introduces himself to me and my roommate, invites us to a college party. Now, we all kind of know what goes on at college parties, and I'll just go ahead and kind of skip to the, the, the end. I didn't go to the party. But I want you to understand something really super important because if it was me, I would still even today be, be tempted to, to put all my focus on whether, I went, whether he went to the party or not, whether he drank the beer or not, whether he whatever or not. But it's not about that, okay? So stick with me. I didn't go, but it wasn't about whether I drank the beer or didn't drink the beer. It was about choosing God or not. Because up until that point, my parents had pretty, I mean, I've, I grew up in a strict home. They guided me well, but some people would say it was a little restrictive. This was 100% freedom. My parents weren't going to know what I did. I could do whatever I wanted. And I, I remember sitting in my room. I can picture myself even now. I had hair back then. <laughs> and uh, I remember sitting there thinking, okay, Steve, talking to myself, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, are you going to forsake everything you've ever been taught? Or are you going to keep on the path you've been? Well, it wasn't a hard decision, but it was transitional. And it was super important. Now, could I have went to the party? Yeah, I could have. But it, and it wouldn't have been anything about the party or whatever went on. It would have been about the spiritual thing that was going on in my heart. Because God was saying, what are you going to do? Do you want what I have for you or do you want what the world has to offer? And I'm glad to say that I didn't go to the party and I chose God. Now, again, is this about drinking? No. Is this about partying? No. It's about listening to God and following his ways for our lives. And if we'll just do that, we get to spiral up. Okay? Here's another example. Um, offenses. This is another uh, great sermon I heard. The gentleman that preached this sermon was Hansi Stain. Um, and he taught about how offenses come at us every day without much we can do about it. We just, that's something we don't have a choice in. You know, a lot of things we don't have a choice in. Okay? So that was pretty cool, right? I actually caught it. Band director that can catch. So... Um, I know, right? See, if you, some of you guys know some, some musicians out there. It's like, yeah, that doesn't happen. But I had no control over the fact that the ball came to me. My choice was in catching it, right? And so the ball represents those things that offend us. Now, I used a football before, and I wanted to mix it up, and all my stuff is packed up, so this is the best I can come up with. But, uh, oh, where's Vicky? Are you here? Yeah. See, Vicky. She's going to be mad at me. I'll, I'll get a little closer. All right. <laughs> you want me to throw it to you? I don't want to catch it. She doesn't want to catch it. She doesn't really want me to throw it to her. She was a little nervous the last time I did this. And, you know, but see, that's kind of my point, though, is I don't, want, I don't want you to throw it to me either. I don't want to be offended. I don't want you to be rude. I don't want you to say things or do things that are going to hurt me or upset me. But I can't really control that. And that's what we want to control. We want to get on Facebook. We want to blast that other person or let everybody else know how much we've been wronged. Right? <laughs> Because we want to control whether or not the offense comes. That ain't your part for some good Oklahoma lingo right there. It ain't your part. Your part is whether or not to catch it. So, oh, who wants to help? Brock, will you help me out? Will you help? All right. So when the offense comes, what should you do?
That was totally unscripted, believe it or not. <laughs> All I had to do was close the cap. It would have been fine. Well, you're never going to forget this sermon. That was perfect. You did great. But we don't do that, do we? We catch it. And not only do we catch it. Oh, I got to have it now. I got I to gotta get this across to you because this is super. This is going to help some people. Because what we do is we catch it. And not only do we catch it, but we hang on to it. Don't. Uh, Pastor Scott comes and he preaches a great sermon. Don't. No. I'm hanging on to this. This is my what I deserve. This is my self-righteousness. This is my they wronged me. How dare they? And, we, and not only that, but we kind of, kind of pamper it. And Oh, my, bless your little heart. I can't believe they said that about you. I can't believe they did that. Okay? Get rid of it. Oh, sorry. I was supposed to go back to Amy. You can hand it back to her. <laughs> so that's a really great illustration. Don't catch the offense. When offenses come, don't catch them. Just, you know what? I'm putting that away. But it's not just about offenses. And that's why I use a different ball because it's a little different message now. See, it's not just about offenses. You know, Ladies, stop getting mad at your husband because they see or a, a pretty busty blonde happens to catch their eye. Stop getting mad at him over that. I'm serious. Stop getting mad because that caught their eye. Now, if they're staring, that's the chance to slug them. All right? But you can't help when ladies are putting it out there. The guys cannot help that. I'm, I'm helping you out, gentlemen. But the problem is, we want to hold on to it. We want to, just like that offense, we want to hold on to it. We want to go, and that's when you get in trouble. That's when things, and I'm not just talking about being disrespectful to your wife, because it can go a lot farther than that. We all know that. You know, you can't help what comes at you. The enemy is going to throw stuff at you. You get to choose what you do with it when it comes. Okay? You know, let's talk about giving. There's another really good example. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, starting with verse 6. You know that giving is mandated by God. It's not just casually suggested. It's kind of a big deal. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your own heart to give. That's the choice. Give what you have decided to give in your own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness." It's not that hard to understand. Few seeds, small harvest. Large number of seeds, sow a lot, bigger harvest. Okay, why is that so hard for us? Well, Pastor Scott always says it's because if you show me your checkbook, I'll show you your heart. Where your treasure is, the Bible says where your treasure is. Most of us, you can see by looking at our check register, our credit card register, where our heart is, you know. And so if uh, the choice is yours as to how much you sow, you don't have to sow. You can sow none. But don't blame God and don't blame the world when nothing comes back, when you have nothing to reap. It also says, you know, don't give reluctantly. If you're going to give reluctantly or, or because you feel pressure, 
Pastor Scott, when is Dr. Stutzman coming back? Do we have a, a date for him? He'll be back, right? And what's he going to say? Cameron, help me out. What's Dr. Stutzman going to do when he comes? A $100 seed. And if you give because of his pressure, you might as well just forget it. You've already missed the point. He's not trying to put pressure on you. He's trying to challenge you. And you get to choose, but you better choose out of the right heart or it's going to be worthless. Okay? So if you, if you choose to give, you know, and just be aware, it'll happen. So if you hear that Dr. Stutzman's coming and you want to accept that challenge, get your $100 seed ready because he's going to challenge you. And, um, you know, also in there, it says that God gives seed. Who does he give seed to? Oh, he doesn't say he gives it to the eaters? Right? Because if you eat all your seed, what do you have left to sow? Nothing. Nothing. You don't have anything left. And that's so much of the time what we do. We get a little bit extra, and we just consume it all on ourselves. So you got to be careful. You, gotta, you have a choice there. You know, when you, when you get a raise, what are you going to do with that? You know, is it all going to be consumed on just entertainment or material things? You know, there's a definite benefit to giving. And what you give, God multiplies that back to you. So if you, if you sow, you're going to reap, right? That's what the scripture says. And when you reap back, you can eat some. That's what the farmers do. They eat a little bit, but they save some so they have more to sow the next time. And that, to me, that was a big, that was a big revelation to me. Because when I get a raise or I get some money that I wasn't expecting, new motorcycle. <laughs> I can't wait to get that next thing that I've been wanting, because, and now I've got the money to do it. But be careful, you know, because if you eat all your seed, you've got nothing left to give, nothing left to sow. And when you sow, you have a continuous harvest. You sow continuously, you, give, you get a harvest continuously. If you give a seed once, God's going to honor that. But when you don't continue giving that seed, well then, the harvest is going to run out. I mean, you can't just give once and then say, all right, God, I'm ready. Bring it all in doesn't work that way, and he tells you clearly in his scripture. So um, another reason for not wanting to, to give oftentimes because, well, I got to eat. I got needs. I got, I'm in debt, I'm sorry to say. I got things that I've got to do. You know, God says, I'll supply your needs. It doesn't say that he just gives you seed for all, only for sowing. He gives you seed for food. And also for sowing. He's going to meet those needs and then above and beyond if you're faithful. But it's about being faithful. You got to choose to be faithful with those things. We all know what happens to people when they learn, when they win the lottery. Typically, they lose it all, right? They squander it on, nobody knows. I mean, it just, it's gone before they know it. Two years later, they're worse off than they were. God's not going to do that to you. He loves you, and he doesn't want to see that happen. So if you're planning on winning the lottery, my suggestion would be figure out what you're going to do with it. Figure out some godly places to sow it. Maybe you got a shot. But God's not going to, I mean, and you've got a shot of one in a million. But, I mean, God's not going to help you. He's not giving you any of his extra help if you're just going to waste it. I would love to be um, considered faithful enough to, uh, to be blessed with a million dollars. I'm not sure I'm there yet. I've got some work to do. I'll just be honest. But being faithful, choosing to be faithful with what you have, with what you, whatever that is, God's going to bless that. You got a choice. All right. What about healing? Uh, give me James 5.14. says that the prayer of faith will make you well, right? Is there anyone among you sick? 
Let them call on the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Do you know that faith is a choice? I don't always feel full of faith. Jim was getting me this whiteboard. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate your help. He went and wrangled this up, found it for me. I said, is there a marker? He says, I'm looking for that. I said, well, I don't know if I have enough faith to write up there with my finger, so you better find me one. But faith is a choice. I don't always feel full of faith. You know, um, we have a wonderful testimony about how God moved and enabled us to be able to make this move. Um, and the way he met those needs and the things that he did were step by step. As we stepped out in faith, he was right there. And he would call us to do something, you know, typically as a teacher, especially as a band director or music teacher, you like to hold on to one job and then hold on, get the next one and then let go of this one. And there's no doubt in my mind that God put it in the heart of my superintendent to not allow me to do that. He got a little bit anxious. He wanted to get rid, he wanted to get the job posted. I hadn't told my students. I hadn't told really anybody. In fact, I had all the control. I got to control everything. I controlled who knew and what they knew. Who I told, and I, you know, only told people I trust that if I said to keep it quiet, they would. I'd controlled everything up until that point, whether I sold my house or not, whether, you know, anything. It was all under my control, and I didn't realize it. And it was not me, because when I said it, it it spoke to me too. I'm like, I was talking to myself, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me. My superintendent says, I want to post the job next week. And I'm freaking out. And Amy is freaking out worse than I am. And so, you know, I got to help her, right? Or so I thought. And I said it before I even knew what I was saying. I said, you know, Amy, it's not faith if you control all the variables. And then I kind of looked at myself for a minute. I'm like, wow, that was that was really good. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't for me. But the Holy Spirit spoke that through me. And, and that's what was, that's what kind of really set the ball, the ball rolling. And everything just fell into place. But it was that step of faith. All right. You have to choose to step out in faith. Peter had to choose to even call out to, to Jesus and say, if it's you, tell me to come. That was a choice in itself. And then he goes, <laughs> idiot, <laughs> you should have known I was going to do it. Get out of the boat. And then he had to choose again. Oh, snap. <laughs> and so he steps out. He chose to step out, and Jesus was there. And then he had to choose again, right? He had to choose to keep his eyes on Jesus or to start looking around. It was really tempting when I didn't have a job yet, and I hadn't even interviewed for a job yet, to let go of a job and not sit around going, well, uh, and then my house sold. I didn't share that part. My house sold the same day that I, that I interviewed for a job. I didn't have the job. I just had went through the interview process. They had not offered me anything, and my house sold that day. <laughs> so now I had a buyer, and I had um, told everybody I, I was leaving, I didn't have a job and I didn't have a house. So now I'm jobless and homeless. It was really hard not to just go, oh, look at all these waves. This is kind of scary out here, you know. But we tried to keep our eyes on Jesus. We tried to keep our eyes on him. He's been faithful. Amy didn't have a job. I got a job eventually. About a week later, Amy didn't have a job yet. And there were three opportunities, all, all at Midwest Dell City. I'm just going to try to get through this really quick. I'm probably running out of time. Um, but three opportunities. This one, never even got an interview. This one, interviewed, didn't get it. This one, closed. She got an email that said, it's gone. Somebody's already, you know, it's already filled. And literally that night, we woke up in the middle of the night after that job had already been filled. That was our last, or at least what looked like our last opportunity for a job for her. And it had closed. We were a little bit depressed, I'll just admit. We were kind of down. And the Holy Spirit spoke to us in the middle of the night, about four o'clock in the morning, from about four to five, we just ended up talking. And I said, you know, I don't believe that God did all of this, everything that he's done all along the way to get me this 
wonderful job and to leave you hanging with nothing. I still believe that God's got something for you, and I believe it's going to be the ultimate, your, your, your dream job. The next day, she got contacted for an interview for that job that had already closed. It was amazing. And she got the job. She interviewed. She got the job. You know, um, and here we are. It's, it's a little scary. I'm not going to promise you that things aren't going to be a little scary, that there's not going to be some waves, but it's going to be okay if you keep choosing God. Yeah. You know, um, one, one last example before I, I wrap it up is, you know, the most important decision that we all have, salvation. You know, what are you going to do with the subject of Jesus? That's what it really comes down to. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you haven't let, given your life to Jesus, there's an opportunity this morning. You, you know, the most basic scripture, if anybody knows any scripture, they usually know this one, John three sixteen, that God so loved the world that he gave his son to die so that we didn't have to perish, but we could have everlasting life. And if you need that this morning, if you have never answered that call, you know, I want to give you a, an opportunity this morning to do that. So as I'm wrapping up, I'm going to tell you, you are exactly where you are today because of the choices you have made. And maybe you're sitting here going, you're right. And boy, I sure am glad I made the choices I made. Or you may be sitting here this morning going, you know what? I've made some good choices, but I've also, I've also kind of slacked off a little bit. And I've made some other choices. I've let some things become more important. And, um, you know, maybe that uh, you're not where you want to be with God. Maybe you'd like to spiral up instead of spinning your wheels in the same place. Maybe you'd like to move deeper with God. There's a chance for you to do that this morning, okay? And you may be here and you've never accepted that call. You've never accepted and you've never made a choice. You've, you know, to not choose is a choice in itself, all right? So if you're sitting here this morning, you're like, you know, I don't know what to do with Jesus. I really just don't know. You know what? That's okay. I don't know is a valid answer. I've learned that as a teacher. Let a kid say, I don't know. They're just being honest. You, maybe you don't know, but you can know. All right? I'm a, I'm a living testimony of what God's, you know, power can do in your life. So it's real simple. We say it here all the time. It's ABC. Admit that you've sinned. Admit that you need what Jesus offers with his death. You deserve to uh, pay the penalty for your sins. Maybe those sins are small, but unless you're perfect, which is God's standard, then you're a sinner, just like all of us. B, believe. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came, that he died for your sins to pay that penalty that you could never pay, that you deserve to pay, but you couldn't really fully pay that debt. And that he rose again, you know, for, for your salvation. And then C, confess, and, and today I'm going to slip in choose. You just got to choose. Choose to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That he's now your focus, and you're going to follow him and his instruction. You're going to choose, as we pointed out in one of the scriptures earlier, you're going to choose his instruction instead of trying to run things your own way or by the world's standards. All right? So, um, why don't you guys go ahead and stand with me this morning? And if, that, if, if you're here today and you would like to just make a new kind of a, a deeper committed decision this morning. Uh, maybe you want to recommit your life. Um, there is, in the backs of the seats, there's a place for you to indicate that. 
all right? I'm not going to have everybody come down front and do an altar call or anything like that. But if that's you, I just want you, as I pray to close this out here in a little bit, I just want you to say that prayer of God. It's a, it's, it's a simple prayer. It doesn't have to sound prairie. Prayer e, you know, like great prayer. All right? You don't have to be practiced up at it. You just have to talk to God and tell him your heart. He knows. All right? And you just have to, you know, God, I want, I want to spend more time with you. I want a closer relationship with you. We're just kind of acquaintances, and I'd like to have more of a relationship with you. All right? Maybe you just want to, you know, if you've been at our Wednesday night services, we've been through this whole um, real-life disciple, discipleship. Maybe that scares you a little bit to, to actually choose to disciple somebody because that is a choice. And just to be honest, most of us have realized throughout this study that we haven't chosen to be very intentional about discipling others. That's about to change. So just a little... Uh, what's that called? A teaser or a little heads up. So um, maybe you'd like to make a, a, a decision today that I'm going to I'm going to do more. I'm going to be more intentional about finding somebody to disciple and discipling them. Maybe you're here today and you need to make that choice for the first time. That you know, I just I just want to know God. I want to know what it's like to have a relationship with him. All right? So, bow your heads with me. God, I just thank you. Lord, I hope that I've spoken only what you've had to say this morning. I hope I've shared what you wanted shared. And I hope, Lord, that uh, everyone here has answered that call, but if they have not, Lord, I just want us to, uh, I just want to pray a prayer right now. If you guys would, let's pray this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for sending your son and offering me the free gift to pay for my sins. I couldn't pay it myself. I believe that you, Jesus, came to die for my sins, to pay that price. And I want to make you Lord over my life.